Welcome to Alpha Bites, where we serve up bite-sized insights to help you grow your business and your bank account. Our host, Alex Zinni, CEO of Alpha Key Digital, dives into the latest marketing trends, proven strategies, and actionable tips to scale your online presence. Whether you're a seasoned entrepreneur or just starting out, Alpha Bites delivers the keys to unlocking your success. Now, let's get started with the show. Hi, everybody. I'm Alex Zinni, your host of Alpha Bites, where I sit down with business leaders and entrepreneurs to learn more about what makes them tick and to learn from their successes. Past guests include Bill and Ryan Streb of Streb Electric, Kara Ogren of Synergy Physical Therapy, and Christine Weber, the CEO of the Menor Chamber of Commerce. This is our first season, so stay tuned for more great guests. But first, this episode is brought to you by Alpha Key Digital. Located in the vibrant heart of Northeast Ohio, Alpha Key Digital delivers revenue-generating digital marketing solutions tailored to plastic surgeons, dermatologists, and any private practice looking to grow their patient base. From cutting-edge SEO and social media strategies to high-performing websites and pay-per-click campaigns, our expert team is committed to driving measurable results that elevate your brand. Whether you're a local business striving to dominate your market or a national brand seeking a competitive edge, our comprehensive suite of services ensures success in today's crowded digital landscape. So to unlock your business's full potential, please visit our website at alphakeydigital.com or book an introductory call with Madison Hewitt at alphakeydigital.com forward slash contact. Before we get into the episode today, I want to give a quick shout out to Casey Vision of Lucas Technologies, who introduced me to my guest today just a few months ago. Casey is a fantastic thought leader in the medical administration and billing space, and just an overall great human being. So I wanted to thank her very quickly. So today's guest is Dr. David Gutman, the owner and CEO of both Cleveland Nutrition and Advanced Hemorrhoid Specialists. Dr. Gutman received his medical degree from Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, and he completed his medical residency at Metro Health Hospital in Cleveland. He has been in practice for 18 years and has built not just one, but two very successful medical practices from the ground up, which is no easy feat, as everyone knows who's listening. He's a husband and a father of four, and when he's not working or studying with his kids, he likes to take long walks with his life and play the piano. Welcome to the show, Dr. Gutman. Hi, thanks for having me, Alex. It's great to have you on here. So tell the listeners, what is it that you do with your two practices? All right, so I have two practices. The first I started in 2007, that's called Advanced Hemorrhoid Specialists. Um, I actually got into the field, which you know people always ask, well, why do you treat hemorrhoids? How do you get into that? It's such a strange thing. Um, I'm not gonna go through the entire story, but uh, suffice it to say that I ended up working for a company called the Hemorrhoid Relief Center in 2005. Um, and uh, it was intended to be just like a short term, one or two year, maybe three year uh, gig. And then I wanted to pursue my fellowship in gastroenterology. Uh, but turned out that once I was exposed to the field, I really liked it um, because patients genuinely got better and usually pretty quickly in the process of treating hemorrhoids so much easier than people were expecting. Uh, and so I, I use non-surgical treatments uh, and they are done right in the office, quick and easy, no anesthesia required, no prep, no recovery, uh, and they're very effective. Um, you know, it's a far cry from, from surgery that uh, most people expect, you know, the, the misery of surgery that, that uh, people expect hemorrhoid treatment to be. Um, so that's the first practice. And then in 2009, um, something unexpected happened. Uh, you know, with my hemorrhoid practice, uh, the, from a billing standpoint, the medical code that I was using for billing these procedures was deleted from the world of coding. Mm. AMA deleted it and it was replaced by a different code that paid about half of the first code. Wow. And understand in 2007, I was just starting out, you know, barely had any patients. Um, and so just like with any practice, you start out, you know, with, with a loss and eventually you try to build your, your practice space up, um, which I was doing. And by the beginning of, you know, by the end of 2008, I was pretty much at break even. Um, and then I had this rug kind of pulled out from under me. And so I'm like, oh man, what do I do? So it was very clear that I needed to diversify. 
Uh, and so try, so I actually took two steps. Um, number one, I incorporated a second procedure that used a different code. So it gave me a little bit more leverage on that end. And then, uh, I tried to dis try to think about, well, what other services, um, can I offer that I could maybe insulate myself from coding and just do it as cash, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not, not billable to insurance at all. And so, uh, after thinking about it, the obvious thing that popped into my head was weight loss. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew nothing about weight loss. And so uh, I would say that I, for the next year, I just you know, devoured everything I could read in the field uh, about weight and nutrition. And um, even went to New York and did a, a physician training program for medical weight loss. And it became very clear and obvious that uh, much of what is taught even to doctors makes no sense. Mm. They even told us, you know, as soon as they stop doing this, they're going to balloon right back. I'm like, well, that's not sustainable. What's the point? Mm -hmm. um, and so just continued to read and read and read and eventually started to get some good information. And as I continued to sort of delve into, so the good information is more of a plant-based approach. And as I continued to delve into that, uh, it became obvious that this was not going to be just a weight loss program. This is going to be a complete health transformation program because, you know, weight is more of a symptom of, of, of an unhealthy diet. Um, just like diabetes is a symptom, just like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, autoimmune diseases, et cetera. So met, the majority, I would say of chronic medical problems can be linked back to diet, um, or other, other exposures. And so basically, um, when I, you know, so, so sure. Great. I had all this information. Now, how do you implement it? Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I was very cautious in the beginning because I'm like, well, I haven't personally tested this stuff. You know, I've read about, you know, I read the studies and I, and I, and I read some books, et cetera. I'm like, okay, let's kind of take this slow. So I just selected a few of my, uh, very, some of my obese hemorrhoid patients, mm -hmm. um, and just kind of told them casually on the side, Hey, I'm looking into trying this. Um, would you be willing to, uh, to, uh, to work with, you know, would you willing to have me work with you to see if we can, uh, if we can, uh, you know, achieve some of these results. Uh, and so my first patient, uh, again, a hemorrhoid patient that I started to work with on the nutrition side. Um, and I put together a plan for him the first week he lost, I think 14 pounds. Um, he was, he was wow. 300 pounds for, for starters. Um, he got off, he was on blood pressure medication. He was on cholesterol medication. He was on gout medication. Um, we got him off of all of this stuff. Um, he ended up losing 80 pounds in 40 months in four months, uh, and continued to lose, uh, thereafter. Um, and, uh, you know, hasn't, you know, hadn't had a gout flare since, uh, at least since last I spoke with him. Um, and he was, and I'm like, oh, I'm really onto something here. And so, uh, gradually started to develop that side of the program. And now, uh, at this point I have a registered dietitian on staff mm -hmm. and, um, really developed into a full fledged program with a lot of online resources and, and, uh, and educational, um, uh, uh educational resources and, um, and, uh, actually got in network with insurance because we still wanted to be able to offer insurance benefits for people that had insurance. Mm -hmm. um, in truth, much of what we do is not billable to insurance. So it's really hybrid. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that we go above and beyond what insurance would pay for would still be out of pocket, but at least whatever insurance could pay for um, will be covered by insurance. Wow. Wow. What an, what an amazing journey. And, you know, it's just, it's so relevant, you know, maybe now more than ever, you know, the idea that very powerful idea that you said this as diet, as being the cause of, of many diseases, um, you know, with all of, especially with, with COVID, the comorbidities and all of the, the mortality rates associated with that, tracing that back to just an unhealthy lifestyle on a diet, um, is, is incredible. And do you, have you found with your um, hemorrhoid patients, would you say that, you know, um, a percentage of those patients is, is due also to their diet that they even have the hemorrhoids to begin with? Um, sometimes, 
Uh, hemorrhoids, again, there are several factors that can lead to hemorrhoids. Um, but in, in many cases, the common denominator is too much abdominal pressure. Mm. And that often is due to diet. Uh, if someone has uh, chronic constipation, of course, that can lead to hemorrhoids. But interestingly, loose and frequent stools also can lead to hemorrhoids. Um, heavy lifting can lead to hemorrhoids, which also increases abdominal pressure. So, you know, we'll have people that, that are weightlifters uh, and, um, you know, or, or do a lot of heavy lifting in their job and, and they will develop hemorrhoids, maybe not related to diet. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, IBS today is exploding and that is primarily a dietary uh, uh, disease. Um, again, there's, there are certainly other factors, but, but uh, diet is still at the root of what's going on of the issues and what would you say i'm sure it's, it's multi-dimensional there's no way to just pinpoint one thing but what is it what what do you think the reason is that the that the ibs is exploding and that what what is it in the diet that's causing it a, a very high proportion of uh, ultra processed foods and animal products and not nearly enough fruits and vegetables and other plant products plant foods wow yeah because i did hear you no mention the the plant-based um that so what is the when you mention a plant-based diet what's a what's a ratio because i know that for the meat lovers listening out there that don't want to give up their right. you know their steaks what percentage of a diet should you should you keep your meat and and what your your fruits and vegetables the more fruits and vegetables the better that's truly the end of the story um and if you actually look at the data there is no cutoff point where this amount of of red meat is going to be okay mm -hmm. i mean certainly less is i mean it's a tough question. It also depends on other factors. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, we work with patients where they're at. You know, not, you know, I don't, I would say a minority of our patients are vegan, become vegan, I should say. Some mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but the key is we want to change that balance. And so, you know, if, if previously the, the, the animal product, the, the chicken breast or whatever was the main dish, and then, you know, like a little, token bit of vegetable on the side. Um, mm. Let's reverse it, make a nice, great, you know, big, you know, tasty vegetable stir fry. And if you want some real chicken, just dice up a little bit of, of real chicken on top of that. So really make the, the vegetable component, the, 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 the main part, the main part. Yeah. <clears throat> wow. And, and so I think a lot of people, I can say myself, I'm very guilty of this, you know, particularly eating too much protein or trying to yeah. get a lot of protein in. Especially because, you know, I hired a personal trainer, you know, about a year ago or so, or two years actually at this point, and, you know, doing weightlifting programs. And then he actually had to get hemorrhoid surgery himself from his lifting habits. But um, I do know that uh, that eating a lot of protein is heralded by that. So with your vegan um, patients or you know, what do you recommend that they get their their protein from their daily amount? From vegetables and beans. And to be honest, don't need to worry about it. I'll explain why. Mm -hmm. um, so even even before I get to that, mm -hmm. conventional, I don't know, know if I want to use the word knowledge, conventional uh, uh, thinking about uh, macronutrients is kind of silly. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, for, for decades, we've been trying to figure out what's the magic ratio of carbs, proteins, fats, and there's still no answer. Why? Because there is no magic ratio. Mm -hmm. um, you know, carbs have been uh, inappropriately vilified. You know, protein has been uh, inappropriately glorified. Mm -hmm. And, you know, fat, you're either in the high fat camp or the low fat camp. You know, there's no, oh, I recommend a medium amount of fat. You know, you never heard of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the truth is that the focus should not be on the macronutrient, like how much carb protein, you know, avoiding carbs, et cetera, you know, pushing protein. What you need to look at is the actual health value of the food that you're eating. You know, as soon as you look at, you know, say carbs are bad, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're equating a lollipop and fruit loops, which are highly overly processed, you know, ultra processed mm -hmm. foods with, you know, squash and beans that are high in carbs, but healthy foods and, and will reverse diseases as opposed to contribute to. And so just calling a food, a carb isn't useful because mm -hmm. it, it creates this artificial box that you're locked into and you and you lock out foods that would have been uh would have been helpful for you 
Um, and protein, the same thing. You know, that uh, I'm not going to get into the history. You can look it up online the history of why protein is, you know, is, is glorified. But um, uh, there is more medical problem that occurs from over consuming protein than under consuming protein. In fact, it's practically impossible to under consume protein. Um, mm. You know, even according to to, to, to the guidelines, you know, the amount of protein you actually need in a day is about maybe 50 grams. Um, and that's more than many people need. Um, most Americans are eating, you know, a hundred plus. And mm -hmm. so, you know, there's no problem of protein deficiency in this country. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and eating protein doesn't magically turn into muscle just because you want it to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, exercise is what causes muscle growth, not protein consumption. You know, if you're, already not protein deficient, eating more isn't going to help anymore. Um, but uh, all protein comes from plants. Right? Let's start with that. All protein on the planet comes from plants. The nitrogen in the soil is fixed by the plant with photosynthesis, becomes amino acids, develops into proteins, and that's where it starts in the food chain. You know, eating, eating a steak uh, for protein, where did that steak, where did that cow get its protein from? They got it from the ground, from plants. Mm -hmm. So, so all protein, calcium is the same. All protein and calcium come from plants. And it's, if you're eating enough volume of food and therefore enough calories of plants, which is not hard to do at all, um, you'll pretty much automatically be getting enough protein. You know, for every thousand calories of, of like a well buried plant, um, plant based diet, uh, for every thousand calories, you get about 35 grams of protein on average. So 2000 calorie diet, you're getting 70. So it's generally not, not a concern. Wow. And that, that really kind of dispels a lot of myths. And I mean, the supplement industry, you know, whey protein. And then if you look at the protein industry itself, you know, with the, just the way the mass, the, the chicken farms and all these different things, sure. obviously there's financial incentives sure. to say, you know, what, you know, the, about the protein explosion. Um, one of the things too is, is what I've noticed in doing some research is that a lot of, a lot of patients develop, um, you know, gastrointestinal issues, go to their primary care physician, they'll get, uh, you know, a Prilosec or a Nexium or something like that to deal with the symptoms. Um, what, what is something that you would advise someone do who's in that position? You mean for somebody like on Nexium, somebody with heartburn because, you know, yeah. heartburn no be clear, at. no clear, um, diagnosis, but you know, no treating a symptom, but there's definitely a diet dietary component involved. Right. In so, world. so again, first of all, it would depend on which symptom we're talking about. You got, you mentioned presumably reflux. Mm -hmm. Um, and so reflux, uh, we can kind of get into why we reflux happens and there's several causes, although they all ultimately boil down to diet, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, if you, so reflux is stomach contents, refluxing up the esophagus. So the esophagus is the food pipe from your mouth down to your stomach. Your stomach is not your big belly. Your stomach is a pouch, uh, just under your left rib cage. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the diaphragm muscle, um, is what we use to breathe, right? So the diaphragm runs just underneath the rib cage. And when you breathe it, when you contract your diaphragm it flattens and that pulls air into your lungs. And then when your diaphragm relaxes, you can exhale. So that when you consciously inhale and exhale, what you're doing is you're, you're contracting and relaxing your diaphragm. The esophagus has to go through the diaphragm to get to the stomach on the other side. Okay. And so the, the, if you want to use the word puncture that the, the path where it goes through, um, you know, you generally is fixed in place from the diaphragm itself, but there is also musculature within the lower esophagus, the lower esophagus called the lower esophageal sphincter, which contracts to also hold things closed. And so reflux occurs for a variety of reasons. It could be because that muscle isn't contracting. There are, there are factors that are causing it to relax. So the, so the, the tube is open. Uh, and so food, food, uh, can reflux up. Or um, you can have what's called a, a hiatal hernia, which is where the, the, the diaphragm is not right at that area where, um, where the, the esophagus transitions to the stomach. Here, let's do it that way. Mm -hmm. Where the esophagus transitions to the stomach, but rather 
but rather the diaphragm, the, the stomach has sort of bulged up over. And so there isn't much holding this closed to prevent reflux of, of, of stomach contents. Um, so the first problem of the muscle being uh, relaxed is generally caused by high fat, mm -hmm. uh, other things as well. Um, so a high fat diet will increase reflux. Um, and the problem of the stomach in general bulging through the diaphragm is generally caused by intra-abdominal pressure, kind of like hemorrhoids. Um, and so the whole stomach will move up when there is a lot of pressure. So the things that cause hemorrhoids can also cause a hiatal hernia leading to reflux, um, including obesity alone, just having all of that, uh, that pressure from having a large abdomen as pressure on that. And so weight loss by itself can reduce that pressure and let the stomach kind of, kind of slide back down. Um, and, uh, those are, I guess, maybe a couple of, of points. There's, there's more to the story, but, uh, just yeah, kind of a little bit of a, preview. yeah. And that, and that's a good, and, and Dr. Gutman just demonstrated there why, you know, for the listeners here who are struggling with any of these issues, it's very important to, to make a consultation and visit Dr. Gutman or in your area, um, a specialist, because there's so many different reasons that it can't just be reduced to a simple answer. But you did mention something about obesity, and I had a question regarding, obviously, there's an explosion of Wigovi, Osempic. <clears throat> these, these are being sold online. These are being sold at, at all sorts of med spas and clinics. And, and um, I wanted to get your opinion on <clears throat> that treatment in general and um, you know, just kind of a 10,000-foot 10, view on it. Uh, sure. Um, so they're amazing drugs. They have side effects. It has to be for the correct person. So let me, let me explain what I mean. Um, ultimately the healthiest way to lose weight is going to be through lifestyle changes. Right. Um, and the reason is, you know, either way you can lose weight and truth is you can lose weight at the same rate either way. Um, but the goal shouldn't just be weight loss. The goal should be disease prevention mm -hmm. and potential disease reversal. Um, you only get that if you're eating a healthy diet, and I'll explain why in a few minutes. Um, but uh, oh, as a side point, one of the one of the uh, predominant side effects of, of 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 these new drugs is constipation. So it's great for my hemorrhoid practice, by the way. Uh, <laughs> so not a joke. Actually, we're getting a lot of patients that wow. have problems since they since they've started these. Wow. Um, that's fine. So, but, uh, but diet is going to be a better option. Again, I'll explain why in a sec, but there will be people that for whatever reason will be unable or unwilling to change their diet. And so if these medications will help reduce their, their risk of di diabetes complications, et cetera, then sure it's worth it. So some diseases are made worse by obesity. Some are not related so much to weight. Um, but for those uh, obesity related uh, uh, complications or, or, or diseases, you know, pick your, pick your terminology, um, losing weight can help, can help with those, with those diseases. Um, again, there are maybe better ways to do it, but if someone is unwilling or unable, then, you know, I would say it's certainly better than, than, than not doing anything. Um, you know, and those people, the risk would out, the, the benefit would outweigh the risk. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are the majority of people that absolutely could, um, you know, make lifestyle changes if they choose to. Uh, and so if, if you are the type of person that wants to do it, you know, the right way and, um, and uh, give yourself dramatically more protection uh, mm -hmm. from, from uh, other chronic diseases. Um, that healthy eating will be the way to go. And if you, the mechanism, do you understand how these medications work? And they were originally designed to be diabetes medications. Um, they, uh, they are chemical mimics of a natural hormone that we make called GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide 1. Something that we make ourselves if you're eating correctly. You know, if you're, if you're not eating correctly, you're not going to make it. Why is that? Because it's made in our gut mm -hmm. and, uh, it's an interaction between our gut wall and the microbes that are living in our gut. So 
the microbes that live in our gut, we talked about microbiome for a minute uh, before, the, the bugs that we feed are the bugs that grow, mm -hmm. right? So the healthy bacteria are, are, are fiber eaters. And so if we're eating a variety of fruits and vegetables and other you know, nutrients called polyphenols in all of these uh, fruits and vegetables and, and beans and all these other you know, plant foods, there's a huge variety of different kinds of fibers. It's not like taking a fiber supplement where it's one fiber, mm -hmm. um, but you know, all of these, these hundreds of different types of fibers, varieties and different bugs eat different uh, kinds of fibers preferentially. Um, and that helps to improve the microbiome, which helps, uh, which helps to support the lining of the colon and the intestine as well. Uh, and once there is a healthy interaction between the gut, the, the gut microbes and the, uh, the, the colonic wall, you're, you will naturally make your own GLP-1. And so you'll get the effect of Ozempic without the side effects because your microbiome is healthy. Yeah, that's and we keep coming back to this common theme. What I'm hearing is basically that the the American diet, with these ultra processed foods, is just really, really hurting gut health and and weight in general. And that's and that's not surprising, just based off of you know what we can see. Um, and I guess it, you and you might have touched upon this already, Doctor Gutman, and I feel like you might have. But if you could say, what's one of the biggest nutrition myths that people walk around with in general? Wow. Um, for weight, it could just it can be just the whatever's on your pet peeve or whatever one comes to. It could be about weight or just in general. I don't know that I have pet peeves because I understand why people you know mm -hmm. believe it because that's mm -hmm. you know common knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I would say that you know maybe uh, the the statement that I just have to eat less. Mm -hmm. as opposed to eating better. Yeah, can you can you go into that a little more? Um sure. Let let's give an extreme ex extreme example. Let's say someone's eating you know th these ultra processed foods mm -hmm. um which uh as as you just met, I, I don't think anybody um you know would argue that you know donuts are going to be you know good for you. So like let's say someone's diet is exclusively donuts. Mm -hmm. All right. And let's say that person is eating three donuts per meal, right? Nine donuts a day. Mm -hmm. And they cut back to two, two donuts per meal. Six donuts a day. That's all you had to do. Great. No, that's not all you had to do. You know, in other words, eating less if you're still eating unhealthy food is not going to get you the results that you want. And mm -hmm. um, it will probably leave you hungry. People tend to forget the hunger component. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, you know, eating less is a short-term strategy, but, you know, we have our normal hunger and satiety mechanisms that drive us to eat. Um, and that's a whole nother topic, mm -hmm. but, uh, but, uh, if you're eating less, you're going to be hungry, even if you ate more than enough calories, mm -hmm. because our stomach has stretch receptors. Our stomach can determine how, what the volume of the food that we ate. Uh, is and that's part of how how we get our feedback for how much we need to eat. And so, uh, if you're under eating, you're not going to get that activation of those stretch receptors in the stomach. And that's not going to send a signal to the brain that said that you to say that you're eating enough. And so, and so you'll be hungry, and so you'll still be craving more. Um, you know, just will it just saying that I'm just going to eat less but still eating unhealthfully. Um, is kind of like saying, well, let me just breathe less. Mm, I see. You know, I'm breathing uh, 14 times a minute. I'll just go down to 12. Well, you can do that for a while, but eventually you get air hunger and then you catch up. And so, and so what you have to fundamentally do is change the quality of, you know, increase the quality, not reduce the quantity. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a hard concept for a lot of people to, to grasp onto. They see this giant plate of of, you know, vegetables and, and all this really great stuff. And then you see this tiny little donut, you know, and yes, calorically, they equal the same thing, right? but, but it's not going to get you towards your goal of being healthy right. and losing weight. Right. And that's the concept of caloric density, mm -hmm. you know, for a certain volume or weight of food, how many calories are in it? So what you want to do is eat foods with low caloric density, meaning high volume, low, low calorie. Mm -hmm. And so you eat enough to be full 
without having overeaten on calories. And again, back to your initial, initial question of, well, what's the proportion? Well, depends on what our goals are also. You know, if we're trying to lose weight, the, the more we can lower the caloric density of your diet, the, the, the faster your results will be. Um, and so where someone that, you know, might not have, you know, any significant medical problems and doesn't really have weight to lose, you know, they might not need to shift quite as much mm -hmm. uh, for prevention. Um, again, if they shifted more, they might have, you know, a reduced risk of certain, of certain, uh, you know, problems down the road. But, uh, you know, it's really a personal conversation with each patient to determine what your goals are, how willing you are, what, you know, what are you not willing to change? What are you willing to change? And, you know, and that's, that's the thing about our practice. We really try to make it work for anyone that's willing to make, to, to, to make movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, it's, it's definitely a tailored approach and, and you can tell the passion that you have for this is, is exciting me. I mean, I just, I could talk about this with you all day, but I do want to take kind of a little different of a turn. So you did go to Case Western Reserve University's medical school, and I, I was an undergraduate student here, so I wore my hoodie today. See, there are you. I want you to, to put yourself back to when you were just starting your medical medical school, and and tell me about when when did you decide one that you wanted to be a doctor, and how did it feel to to start medical school? Ooh, um, I'm one of those nerds that kind of always wanted to be a doctor. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, like like you know, from single digits, I think that was where I felt like I was going. It wasn't, you know, locked in, but that was kind of already my, my path in my head from, from a very early age. I don't know why. I don't know what inspired me. I, I don't know. Um, but that was, uh, so that seed was somehow planted a long time ago. And it was not my Jewish mother that <laughs> planted the seed. It wasn't from her. Um, and so, uh, in medical school, how was that to start? Um, again, it's it was it was interesting. The you know I've I've always kind of been like you know a straight A student and um, you know top of the class. I'm not bragging. I'm just, I'm just you know I was given that, and so uh, you know generally studying came pretty easy to me. Um, and so in medical school, you're now in a class with all of those people. Mm -hmm. Um, and case med school happens to be pass fail. So it takes a little bit of that pressure off. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, but suddenly, you know, the volume of information you're being fed per day is the amount that you would have been fed per month. Mm -hmm. And so, um, it really, it, it really, you know, starts to, starts to overwhelm pretty quickly for not keeping on top of it. Mm -hmm. So that was probably for me, the biggest change. Wow. Yeah, it, it's it, it, of course it's no surprise to hear that you're at the top of your class and, and always number one in all those things because that's just comes with the territory of being you know a physician and a specialist. Yeah, but, most doctors probably. and most doctors, yeah, yeah, exactly. But then I can picture you now being and walking into that classroom and then you're all you're all number one, you know, and it's it's a great uh, it's a great feeling. Did you have any um, mentors that you know from medical school who? you know, um, gave some great advice to you? And if so, what was one of the best pieces of advice you've gotten? Um, good question. Mentors in medical school. I don't know that I did. Mm -hmm. What I about in general, know. like even outside of medical school, do you have a mentor who comes to mind? Um, so I have some online mentors mm -hmm. that I haven't met personally. Um, Darren Hardy is, is excellent. Mm -hmm. You know, both from a personal growth and a business growth standpoint, you know, I, I've taken some of his courses. They're phenomenal. Um, I have worked with some, some coaches, you know, one-on-one -on -one indiv individually, mm -hmm. um, more so in the last few, like post COVID years, mm -hmm. um, just because I, I sort of reinvented a lot of how I was doing things post COVID. And so, you know, however, I, I set things up initially back in 2007, Sure, we've you know we've made some changes, and I mentioned the pivot, and we've sort of adapted to to minor changes, but I didn't really make any fundamental changes to how how our practice was running. Mm -hmm. um, post COVID, um, made a number of changes. Uh, primarily, the the big change is I changed the software that I was using. I went to like I went electronic, mm -hmm. so we were using paper charts. Um, moved to electronic. Uh, because the, the software that I was using back since 2007, it was, it was a great looking software in 2007. Um, you know, for that, this is for like medical scheduling and, and billing and, and all the practice management stuff. 
uh, it was great. And it, you know, after, you know, from 2007 until around, you know, 2019 or 20, whatever it was, um, it didn't really develop very much and it was looking very outdated and clunky. And so I was just looking for something a little bit fresher, a little bit newer, something that would be more patient friendly from a patient online portal standpoint, et cetera. Um, you know, the other software had a portal, but it was like unusable. Um, and so I tran transitioned to another uh, bit of software at that time. Um, I, obviously it takes a long time to set up new software with, with, uh, uh, templates and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and everything. But, um, but, uh, ended up working with, uh, uh, a, a coach, uh, Brad Cote, this is name, he's in, uh, uh, Canada, um, just online through zoom. And, um, he helped me set up a CRM, which I had never used before. Um, it was active campaign at the time. I tried to something else since then, but, um, really got me thinking in terms of, wow, you know, this is not 2007 anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we can really take this, uh, you know, from, from a tracking standpoint and re-engagement standpoint and, and really bring it up, uh, you know, pretty significantly. And so, uh, worked on setting up, you know, automations and, and emails going out, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, um, and then you mentioned Casey. So I helped, I worked with her as well, uh, a little bit, also helping to set up some of these, uh, more advanced automations. Um, so I definitely had help along the way. Um, but I would say most of this has been in the last five years that I really feel like I, um, you know, left the previous, um, you know, plateau and, and, and moved up. Wow. And, and that's, you know, um, we've only had a few interactions and, and are, you know, just getting to know each other. But one thing I can definitely say is it's very impressive, you know, as an autodidact, I mean, you're definitely someone who is a self self starter and a learner, and you really take you know, take things and, and, and move with it. And that's, that's difficult to, to reinvent yourself that way. Um, and to do that, if you could say, um, you know, just kind of pivot into you in a different direction here, what, what do you do? Like what's, what's a daily habit or ritual or routine for you that you do to stay on top of all of this, all of these different things, running practices, the medical, the, the entrepreneurial aspect of it, how do you balance everything? Um, I would say I probably, uh, have my routines. Mm -hmm. you know, if you have to think about it all, you, you'll forget. Mm -hmm. So I kind of have, I have my, so rituals. Sure. So again, with regard to Darren Hardy, um, he has like a, uh, a email Darren daily. So it's like a five minute inspiration thing. I watch that every morning. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, throughout the day, if I have downtime, um, I have different, uh, uh, RSS feeds about medical and nutrition stuff that comes through, um, and kind of keep up with that. Um, you know, I don't know. <laughs> it's a lot agreed. Um, but, uh, I don't know. I feel like I'm lacking if I don't do these things. Mm -hmm. I feel, I feel like, wait a second, you know, uh, it's become ingrained in, into your habit. habit. Yeah. yeah. Well, Dr. Gutman, this has been, this has been an incredible conversation and, um, for the listeners out there, um, where can they go to learn more about, you know, the, the nutrition and then also the, the hemorrhoids, where can they go to find you? All right. So, um, our websites are probably the best, the best uh, place to find out more. Um, the hemorrhoid practice is sensitivecare.com and the nutrition practice is clevelandnutrition.com. Awesome. Well, we've been talking to Dr. David Gutman. He's the owner of Cleveland Nutrition, Advanced Hemorrhoid Specialist. Again, his website is clevelandnutrition.com and sensitivecare.com. And uh, if patients want to get started with you, what, uh, what's the best way for them to do so? Uh, both of those websites have uh, contact info that you can even self-schedule. Um, you can certainly call our offices. Um, phone numbers are on the websites. Uh, I can give them to you if you like, <laughs> but, uh, sure. yeah. uh, so the hemorrhoid, the hemorrhoid practice would be 216-772-4653. Nutrition practice would be 216-328-8086. Yeah. And we have offices in Beechwood as well as Fairlawn near Akron. Beautiful. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Gutman and have a great day. All right. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Alpha Bites. If you found today's insights valuable, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, and share the podcast with your network. 
Let's keep the conversation going. Connect with us on social media or visit us at alphakeydigital.com slash alphabytes. Remember, the keys to your digital success are just a bite away. See you next time.